While I'm very excited, as joining me today is Sheldon Surrey. Nicknamed the Hammer, he went on to have one of the hardest shots in NHL history, led both the Oilers and Habs in scoring. He even holds an NHL record for most playoff, sorry, most power play goals in a season with 19. But it's his time away from the ice that he's found most rewarding, being a dad, being a husband. You just put Ollie down. Sheldon, thanks so much. Welcome. Thanks for having me, buddy. Pleasure. So you've had quite the whirlwind of the last couple of weeks, couple of months, actually. Christmas, New Year's, a couple of golf charity events, and then obviously the birth of, of Ollie. What have the last several weeks kind of been like for you? Oh, man. Um, it's been a long time since I've been a new dad. You know, my kids are 20 and 16. And uh, my life was completely different than, you know, playing hockey and um, not being around too much. So I am, I am just so grateful that I'm able to do it at this point in my life with, uh, with my wife and having a little boy. And I never thought I'd be in this position talking about having a newborn, but man, I feel like the luckiest guy in the world. Dude, that's amazing. And, uh, with that, you and Tess, you know, you kind of found each other early on in your roads to recovery and you've championed mm -hmm. a ton of cool stuff together, a physical lifestyle, definitely being uh, kind of at the forefront of it. Have either of you participated in the Coeur d'Alene Ironman Triathlon yet? These guys are animals. I mean, that whole triathlon, it um, it shuts down the city, you know. Uh, the answer to your question is no, absolutely not. I'm way too <laughs> weak for that. Um, maybe something to, not even something that I could, you know, set as a goal because they're just such freak athletes. Um, but I see them swimming, you know, in the lake and I see them riding their bikes all around the lake, which is, which is quite a haul. And, uh, of course running in the city. So I got a ton of respect for those guys. That's way out of my league. Yeah. Fair, fair. I mean, even <laughs> then though, you become at least quite the avid golfer. Um, and with that, can you actually tell us about the time where you scored an ace while golfing with Wayne Gretzky? What was the hole? What yeah. club did you use? <laughs> did you rub it in a little bit? So we were at a golf club up in Northern Idaho and um, it was July 4th, uh, 2016. My dad had passed away just a couple weeks earlier. So um, I wasn't in the greatest of spirits and I was playing, you know, obviously it's a holiday in the States and, um, you know, Gretz and a couple and John Elway was another guy who was in it. And they said, Hey, come on in and I'll play some golf. And I did. And I scored, or scored. I made a, a hole in one on um, a par three. That was 163 yards. Uh, I hit a pitching wedge and there was two other guys that I was playing with. There was five, some, one of them being my best buddy, JJ. And uh, they got all excited. You know, I just, I wasn't, over, I, I really didn't think it had gone in, but the, the coolest part about it is uh, Gretz was standing over by the tee box and everyone's kind of going nuts. And he was cool as a cucumber. And he looked over me, and goes, Son, that's in. And it was a quote, like I remember it like it happened yesterday, you know, to get a hole in one with Wayne Gretzky and John Elway and, uh, and a couple other of my closest friends it was pretty cool. I don't think I've come even close since. And that was what, seven years ago. That's fair. I mean, you had your moment to shine, so at least there's that. <laughs> I think I know the answer here, though. Um, but we'll ask, what would you rank higher? Golfing with Gretzky, John Cooper, and the Stanley Cup? Or having the very first and likely only Hammer Invitational of September 2021? You know, the Hammer Invitational was the day before our wedding with my very closest friends, including 99. Um that was i was at a, a, a i didn't win the cup so it was very you know uh thrilling to be with coop and very generous from him and tyler johnson to bring it up you know when their their days when they could spend it anywhere they chose to spend it with us up at our you know our small little golf club um to get a photo with coop who's one of the greatest guys i've ever met and wayne gretzky was that like you know the nine or ten year old me would be freaking out obviously um but having my closest friends around to come celebrate you know getting married to the to the moment of my dreams um that's you know that's hard to beat what would you say is more stressful than designing a tattoo or going through and designing 
Tessa's rose gold oval engagement ring? <laughs> um, there's professionals in both industries. You know, I'm just, a, I just throw out the ideas and they come up with them. So not too much work on my part, but um, you know, I get to look at a beautiful ring and a beautiful person. And I also got uh, tattoos that mean something to me from a close friend, Luke Westman, who's one of the best in the business. What was it like having personal friend and country star Dirk Bentley sing during your wedding weekend? Uh, so a funny story. I met Dirks back in, it must have been like 06 or 07, something like that. And um, we were at uh, these, uh, we were in Nashville at like an award show after party. And I was in this bar and he came up to me and I've always been a big country music fan. I grew up on it. I, I love it. But musicians in my family. So he came up and he said, Hey man, Sheldon, sir, I'm a big fan. And I'm like, dude, who put you up to it? He was just getting going. Right. He, he wasn't a huge star then like he is now, but um, we just hit it off. He's a huge hockey fan. He loves playing. He's got a son now Knox that plays and is a really good player in Nashville. Dirks is the ultimate uh, family guy. Uh, there's a lot to be to be learned from him. Um, but I would say that probably one of the most nervous I've ever been in my life is he was performing a show in Edmonton. And um, just before he went on, he said, hey, buddy, you're going to come on, you know, I'm singing free and easy and you're going to come on stage. Dude, I almost, I froze up and I, I think I had six of the quickest beers you've ever seen <laughs> drank. And I went out there and I, you know, I tried to own it, but I was so nervous. Um, but that's the kind of guy he is. He just brings, uh, brings people along for the ride to celebrate his success. And that's the kind of guys I want to be around, you know, especially as I get older. Um, you know, if you don't have a circle of friends who are lifting you up, then, you know, you got the wrong friends. Yeah, fair enough. Well, it sounds like it was a wicked day too. So congrats to the two of you on that. Mm. You credit nice. Scotty Stevens a ton with teaching you about professionalism during your early days in hockey. And when you had to go through your reassignment in Hershey during your time in Edmonton, did you take some of that of what he taught you um, to kind of mentor and teach those younger players what it was like to be a pro? Yeah, probably not necessarily, you know, Scotty in that instance, but I had been, you know, in the league for, quite a while by that point you know I think it's probably 13 or 14 years at that point and um I'd seen a lot I'd been through a lot by that point and you know at the end of the day it's a business uh I learned that and you know I had known that but it hadn't really you know fell in my lap like it did during that but hey I was getting paid I was playing hockey it was you know I really felt it was my job to go down there these guys are making, you know, 20 or 30 or $40,000 a year. You know, they got jobs on the side and I was coming down from the NHL and, and I was still making, you know, the money I was making. And I just felt like I owed it to myself to be a professional. Um, but also to these guys, you know, to see a guy that not necessarily me, but they watch guys on, on TV and they want to play in the NHL. Hey, you know, everyone who plays wants to play in the NHL. And I, I just really felt like, I was going to go down there and um, be a part of it, not separate myself from the team, but be a part of it. And it was a good lesson for me too. You know, it was, it was a good opportunity to, uh, you know, not just talk to talk, but walk the walk. And I had a, I had a fun time down there. It wasn't the best circumstances for sure, but um, you know, great guys and a great management and, you know, they all pushed me to, to get back up to the NHL, you know, I had a tough year with injuries and stuff down there again. And it's, it's the way it was, but it's not those guys fault either. Like that. I, I was coming down and I was taking someone's job. You know what I mean? So I, I there's no way I would have went down there and thought that I was bigger than a team. Um, and yeah, I learned a lot. Uh, I learned a lot about myself that year too. You know, the challenges that came from that was different than having an injury, you know, um, so it, you know, it's a chance you can always learn and you can always, you know, take your experience and maybe help someone else down the road. So it wasn't all bad. It wasn't great, but it wasn't all bad for sure. You, you do go into pretty good detail and great length about talking about like hardships and the lessons that you can at least take away and, and learn from there. Uh, the one thing I was always kind of curious about is, you know, it's, you've also gone to great detail about the injury and, you know, the lack of communication from Edmonton to you and 
them not knowing the severity because they just didn't take the time to reach out. Um, mm. Have they ever tried to reach out since to make amends to at least kind of repair that relationship? Or is that bridge kind of over that road kind of closed? You know, I, um, well, a couple things, I guess. I went and played in a charity golf thing, an alumni charity golf uh, event in the summer of 2017. I think with, uh, with Wayne Gretzky and Ray Whitney, we flew from Gaza, we flew up to Banff, uh, a lot of alumni guys, a lot of ex oiler you know, Glenn Sather threw it through this golf event. So, you know, a lot of ex oilers and Montreal Canadians, and, um, uh, I was really hesitant to go. I didn't want to go. And if there's one guy in the entire world, that's the ultimate professional, uh, an ultimate human being. It's Wayne Gretzky. He said, come on, we're going to go and it's going to be fun. And so, you know, I, I had a chance to talk to Kevin Lowe at that event and um, you know, a lot of time had passed, you know, there's one thing I've learned and I wasn't sober then, but the one thing I've learned in, in sobriety is, you know, there's no sense in holding on to like, these things, these resentments. Like my life, when I played in the NHL after that, it wasn't like it ruined my career. Um, so you know, we kind of turned the page on that. And then um, also last year when the Oilers were playing against the uh, uh, the Knights in the playoffs, I had opportunity to take out Keith Gretzky and Ken Holland and Steve Steos out to, you know, my home club here and play golf. And um, yeah, bygones are bygones, right? Like we, it doesn't affect me. It doesn't affect them. A lot of time's gone by. And if there's an ultimate matchmaker or uh you know guy who's going to smooth it it's going to be Wayne Gretzky and and I'm sure glad I'm his friend like I, I just never would have thought growing up that you know he'd be a friend of mine I could call him a friend but um he's showed me a lot off the ice about what professional and uh uh how would I say it you know what being a professional is like but just how to be a really kind human being you know he's the great one for a reason and if you can't when you see him integrate himself in any situation and he doesn't even know he's Wayne Gretzky, well, you know, there's no room for me to be bitter or, you know, hold on to things that really don't matter. That's fair. And it was in your time in Montreal. I'm also curious about this. I think this was the second lockout of your career uh, since you were drafted. You and Marty Broder went on to open a pizzeria together, <laughs> being a dad. I imagine kids are probably among the harshest and most honest food critics out there. Have you ever made pizza for Val and Scarlett? And what was their kind of feedback for you? Uh, they, they're not going to eat their dad's cooking. You know, I'm a, I'm a craft dinner and hot dog type guy <laughs> for uh, cooking for them. So they were never that spoiled, but man, that, you know, I had my rookie party when I was with the devils in Montreal and we became friends with, and then I got traded to Montreal and we became friends with um, Andre who owned, probably the best Italian place in Montreal. And as you know, Montreal has some of the best food on the planet. And that opportunity just came up. We, we lent, you know, we lent our names to it and we let the, the guys who uh, knew how to run a, a restaurant and, and cook food, we let them do their thing. And we just happened to, you know, slide in there and, and lend our name. And it was, it was something fun to do with friends, you know, anytime you get a chance to do something with Marty Brodeur and, uh, Montreal, uh, you know, you do it. And you spent a lot of time in New York when you were in playing with New Jersey. You obviously spent a lot of time in Montreal. You are born to a Métis reserve, kind of grew up close to Edmonton. Where would you rank these three iconic food items, the New York Slice, the Montreal Poutine, and the Edmonton Donaire? Where would you put them on the podium, one, two, or three? Oh, bro. <laughs> uh, uh, I... I gotta go with the super donair in edmonton with a little cheese i have to go with the super donair um every time i go back that's on the that you know that that's on the hit list poutine is iconic there's actually a place in uh la a couple brothers i think they're from toronto but it might be montreal they have a food truck in la it's called poutine brothers um so they send me these kits through gold belly uh, so I love that. It's like a massive treat. And then, you know, pizza is obviously great, but it, to me, uh, that's a, like a distant third. Nice. Fair, fair enough. I'm happy Donaire kind of slotted <laughs> in that front though. 
Me personally, I'm a huge burger guy. And I'm curious, if I were to visit Northern Idaho, where would I find the best burger? Would it be Hudson's Hamburgers, Rogers, or Surf Shack? Wow, buddy, you've done your you've done your homework. My wife and I love Rogers. Uh, some people would say Hudson's for sure. And then there's like a new place that does like the smash burgers. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but it's um it's supposed to have like another world class burger. But Rogers Burgers, dude, you go through Coeur d'Alene, you're stopping there. Milkshake. Right. A little huckleberry milkshake. Come on. Dude, literally painting. I'm going to drive there right now. I'm oh, driving on... right now. But, you know. <laughs> Yo, shoot me a message. Let me know what you think. <laughs> I'd love to uh, get a kind of first look at it. With that, though, I'm curious then, do you get fries on the side? Do you get a salad? What's a, what's a side option when you're going Bro, to? Oh, come on. <laughs> salad. <laughs> We're not rabbits. Yeah. When we, yeah. when I, 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 there's nothing that I love more than a good burger, fries, and a milkshake. My wife's the same way. She's just stays in tremendous shape, so she can eat that whenever she wants. I got to, you know, I'm a little older now, so I got to be careful. But um, there's nothing I love more than a good burger, French fries, and a milkshake. With those fries, are you getting the Idaho famous fry sauce with it, or are you a ketchup guy? I'm ketchup. I I don't like my wife sauce. Uh, and she's not a big sauce person, but she likes sauce on the, you know, with the fries. I just like ketchup, but they're, they're kind of old, you know, Idaho is known for potatoes, right? So they're kind of the old school potatoes that still have the skin on them and they're like cooked in duck fat. So it's, yeah, you don't need anything, but a little ketchup and, you know, wash it down with a shake. Atta boy. I mean, I'm, I'm starving. starving. I'm starving. <laughs> I guess we know what yeah, your dinner too. plans are. <laughs> Me too. Um, so you're gonna say you're a strawberry shake guy right yeah strawberry shake dude yeah, for sure yeah. and it kind of started what born edmonton grew up in calgary but peter's drive-in don't know if you've ever been dude in calgary yep yep when i was a kid we'd play in hockey tournaments and that was our reward like that was my reward for you know if, if we uh I mean, I would say if we played good, it wasn't that. It was our reward, you know, our incentive to play good, whether we played good or not. Driving through Peters was like, uh, that is, there's Wayne Gretzky, and then there's driving through Peters drive through for a burger. Dude, honestly, the thing, honestly. I, miss, the thing that I miss most about uh, having moved out of Alberta all these years ago, honestly, it's Peters. There's like nothing I hold to that higher standard. Peters and Donaire's. Easy one and one A one B. Yeah, yeah. Um, now you're a student of hockey as much as you are a mentor and a teacher, and you've been very generous and humble when talking about the players that were there before you and the players of today, the players of right now. Um, pound for pound, who was a player that impressed you the most during your playing days? Oh man, um, the you know, the best player. I got to say Alexi Kovalev was probably the most skilled player that I ever seen or played against. I mean, uh, Sergei Fedorov was incredible. Uh, Joe Sackick and Forsberg in their prime when playing against college, like, man, Eric Lindros, you know, there's so many guys that, that when I was, when I got to the NHL, I seen a lot of these guys in their prime, and I, like I felt like I was so out of place. Like these are guys that I seen on TV. You know, as a matter of fact, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, one of my first games I played in the NHL were in Madison Square Garden, and um, uh, we're playing the Rangers. Messier and Gretzky come down, pass it. You know, two on one. Obviously, they pass it. They score. I skate to the bench. I'm sitting on the bench and I'm looking up at the Jumbotron and MSG. And uh, I just watched, you know, Messier pass it to Gretzky and he, he scored on us, you know. And Larry Robinson tapped me on the shoulder. And I look back and he goes, hey, hey, it was the games right out there. And he used a couple other words. It was the games right out there. And um, it was awesome. You know, it was like, wow, I, I, I made it. I, like, I'm here. Um but it was also like, a, I always talk about it growing up in the New Jersey Devils organization. That's where you learn professionalism. So I also felt like even that was like a little bit of a backhanded, like, hey, get with it. It was also like, 
hey, you're you're playing this game, so so get with it, you know. Um, but yeah, I just I don't know, it just made me think of that story, and uh, yeah, so many good players. I imagine that um, when you were playing, there were a lot of games and a lot of days where you felt good, you felt great, but the results just weren't there. How would you ban- balance that? How would you balance your emotion, your your play? How would you just balance all of that when you're playing well, but it's just not going the team's way? Well, you know, I think playing in good organizations uh, and you, you surround yourselves, you know, there's coaches that have different ways to handle that. Um, there's teams, there's other players that you get close to that handle it a, a certain way. Um, what I will say is in Montreal, I really learned how to be a professional. You know, you have all these alumni that are around day in, day out, some of the greatest players that have ever played, greatest stats that have ever, you know, uh, been kept. And so I really learned, like, like, don't think you're all that, because if you lose the next game, you're in every paper as well saying, you know, they should trade you. So you really have to learn how to, like, just – uh keep an even keel you know my family was really good at humbling me like they always seen me as as who I was and not what I did um and I think it's important to have that in your life where it's not like people always hockey 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 you know there's a there's a life away from that and I've always been very lucky that my family has been super supportive and super down to earth my buddies that I grew up with you know they didn't they 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 didn't, I mean, they cared. It was cool that I played in the NHL, but um, they also knew me since I was a, you know, fat little 11 year old. So then they'd remind me, you know, so it's, it's just that, you know, it comes with a little experience. I think too, you know, when you're young, everything, you know, you get into one free club or they buy you a drink somewhere and, you know, you think you're Brad Pitt. And um, so with, with some experience, you learn that it's just, and you, you already mentioned an example of like going to Hershey, like there's life will humble you, you know, so you better be ready to, to, um, if you're going to take the good with the good, you better be ready to take a little bit of uh, water in the boat too. Well, with that support system that you had, especially in Montreal, you have a really good relationship with uh, conditioning coach, Scott Livingston. Um, what would you say is a position like a staffing position on a team that kind of gets things going, maybe might be the heartbeat of that team, but just doesn't get a lot of credit. Wow. What a great question. Um, You know, it's, it's really, it's the trainers, right? It's your stick trainers. It's the assistant trainers that, you know, you break a stick, they got to run to the back. It's you break a skate lease, they got to run to the back. Um, those guys are just as important. It sounds so cliche, but those guys are the guys like, you know, giving you a pat on the, in between periods. The coach might have just showed a video clip that you just got, you know, walked by two guys. Um, those are the guys that are tapping you on the pants and let's go and a smile. I mean, you just never know where, where a little inspiration comes from, you know, and really the best organizations that I've been a part of, um, those guys, those support guys that are around, they don't care who gets the credit. They're just happy to, you know, to be there and to support you. Know, Scott Livingston, you know, I had a lot of injuries when I was in Montreal. There was a lot of days when, you know, uh, we didn't get along. You know, there's a lot of days where we swore at each other and he kicked me off the ice one day, told me I wasn't working. I mean, that, you know, we see these games, we see these players sometimes and you think that everything is just cool. It's not, you know, it's just like a relationship behind the scenes. Stuff is going on all the time. Um, so you have to be around people, too, that don't take it personally. You know, if we're just talking about hockey, um, everyone just wants to win. And they want to do what they can to win. And they're motivating you in, in, in some way. Like an example is the assistant trainer or the strength coach isn't trying to take my job, right? They're just trying to make me better. However, they got to do that. And you don't see eye to eye. You don't see eye to eye with your, your mom and dad. You don't see eye to eye with your, you know, your wife or your best friend all the time. I mean, um, but you have to be able to let things go. Uh, sorry, buddy. I apologize. Oh, you're good. You're good. You have to be able to let um, things go. 
no no it's all good um yeah you have to just be ready to yeah you have to be able to let things go and realize that you know <clears throat> you're all working towards one goal which in in prof if you're a professional it's winning um but it takes everybody that's a great question though but that's a really good question thank you thank you for going into detail and you know sharing a lot of the insight behind the scenes and what it's like in between games and how much harder that can be so thank you for being open about that now with that and with how often you would sacrifice you know your body out there it was also a job job that you got paid for you bought a jeep when you were 18 and you paid for mm. it at the dealership with a brown paper bag full of cash have you since changed your ways when it comes to buying cars have you discovered the world of financing uh, it's you know I wish they taught financing in school. You know yes. what I mean? It, yes. We learn, we learn uh, algebra and we learn, uh, you know, all these things that really you never learn, never really use in the real world. Um, yes. The answer to your question is yes. I've, I've, I've learned financing uh, some hard lessons along the way. And I, I was really lucky though. When I was in New Jersey, I played with Doug Gilmore and then he came to Montreal early 2000s and he hooked me up with a, um, a guy who took care of my financial stuff for the rest of my career. And I, I mean, I know not everybody has a guy like that, but everybody should have a guy like that. Cause you know, when you're young like that, for me anyways, it was just easy come easy go, you know, spending more than I was making and um, it just wasn't sustainable, but yeah. Yeah. I haven't bought a car with cash and, a very long time. Look, as fun as the Jeep probably was, where does the Bronco rank on your all-time, you know, most fun cars that you've owned? Uh, which one? The one that I re recently had on my Instagram thing, the black one? Yeah, the matte black one. Yeah. Yeah, it's, that's, a, that's a cool car. Uh, I love cars, but I don't really get attached to them. I like bringing them to life and using them for for however long and i'll usually sell one to a friend or someone will stop me you know I, people stop me on the street and go hey i want to have that car um but it's a really cool car it's it's a head turner for sure great for the lake with with all the cars in that you kind of cycle in and out is there a car in the fleet that you've participated with at the car delane no but they have a, a the, what you're talking about. Cardellina is like a car show down. Uh, well, it's like a parade down the center, the main street of Coeur d'Alene. They call it Cardellina, uh, like you just said. But man, you wouldn't believe how many nice cars are there. Like th these people have had original cars since, you know, the 60s or the 70s wow. or the 80s. So, you know, we see like these big auctions, Barrett Jackson or Meekum or, you know, people there have had these original cars that they don't drive in the winter. Um, so you're seeing some like really, really cool cars. So I've never put one in there, but uh, it's one of the highlights of my summer is going to see them. What's uh, what people are driving up there. Yeah, I bet. Uh, there was a moment where access Hollywood called you the sexiest man in the NHL. You've always had a great sense of style off the ice, especially uh, lately, you, Tess, the kids have been doing a lot of like themed costumes, themed parties and events and stuff like that. Do you have an idea of what kind of costumes you'll all be wearing at whatever event throughout this year? So what will our next event be? It'll be, uh, well, really we get, it's either someone's birthday party, you know, and as you get a little bit older, people like, you know, we don't go with the clubs. Um, you know, we're not in Vegas with the uh, sparklers and, and pop and bottles. So usually people, when you get a little older, are having like some sort of themed birthday. So that's where you see a lot of that come from. And my wife is really, really good at getting creative for Halloween. So I don't, I don't ask questions. I don't even have input because she's so much smarter and she makes these things come to life. So whatever it is, I know it's going to be cool and I don't mind looking, I don't mind embarrassing myself for, you know, a day or two. When you were playing, who's a teammate that other than you had the best sense of style and fashion? Uh, the best sense of style or fashion would maybe be Saku, probably. Uh, Koibu had, he was very, very, uh, he was very polished, 
you know, very polished. I remember asking him one time how much his shoes were, and I think he told me twelve or thirteen hundred dollars. And <laughs> oh you know, I almost opened the door and jumped out of the car. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. I didn't know stuff cost that much. Um, but he was always a very, very classy guy. Um, he took me one time actually to get a suit made in Montreal. And I said, Yeah, of course we'll get a suit made, you know. I'm, I'm a big shot. So we went and did all the measuring and had, you know, a cappuccino when we were there and all this. And the guy gave me the price tag and I walked out, right? I gave him my credit card. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I walked out. And once I got in the car away from SAC, I called him back. I said, you know, I'm just not going to take that suit. I just had no clue what he got me into. He was probably getting a commission on it or something. But... <laughs> There's always a side objective for sure. For sure. Um, so that kind of leads me to my next point where as a hockey fan, we hold a lot of certain moments and memories to, you know, a high standard. We reflect on certain things as a fan that we've seen that we really liked. I'm curious though, if I can rifle some of these career moments and highlights, can you take us back to those moments in time on what it was like on the player side of things? So first we'll start with having your mom play goalie at that player parent game way back way back when in the day uh so i was pretty young i do remember uh my dad had never played hockey he'd never skated he was working he was a truck driver it was a um it was a dad's against son's game and so my dad wasn't there so my mom said well you know i'll jump in and she played goalie and uh i think i snuck a couple by her uh she wasn't that good <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I guess that might have paved the pathway for uh, your NHL career because tell me what it was like setting a franchise record with the Montreal Canadiens scoring six points in a game against the Pittsburgh Penguins. That was kind of surreal. It wasn't like, you know, I played some game that was, uh, I didn't do any, you know, a, man, I put a couple pucks off the glass and out. And I remember Chad Kilger got a breakaway and went and scored. You know what I mean? Like absolutely nothing out of the ordinary that game at all. I wasn't even really paying attention to it. We we got up. I think we won that game 8-1 maybe. Um, eight nothing. We had got up and I – eight nothing? It was eight, eight nothing. nothing. Well, see, I wasn't even – I wasn't even a minus that game. So that's good. <laughs> You're cool, um, man. You're good. You know, man. Um, I just – I remember – the only thing I remember about that game, the thing I remember most vividly is we were on the bench third period. I must have gotten like, you know, the six point or whatever. And Craig Rubey, who was one of my best buddies and my defense partner, he said, hey, I want you to sign a stick for me after the game. And I'm looking, I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, dude, you just, you know, it was nothing I ever thought. Like, that's how un, un, um, it was not a glamorous game at all. Um, so I'm really surprised that even happen it surprised me I, I wasn't keeping track of it you know I got a hat trick once and that like I knew exactly I could tell you probably the times I scored in that game the game where I got six points I, I couldn't tell you you know I didn't make one good play that game <laughs> I mean the stat sheet would say otherwise but fair enough <laughs> this one's from my buddy Jonathan he's curious what happened and what went into the moment where you and I quote were beating the snot out of Darren McCarty <laughs> um so it was the first shift of the game we we're playing in calgary and my dad had drove up for edmonton and he brought a couple friends to the game and um i think i got kicked out of that game <laughs> or i didn't finish the game so something happened because my dad was not happy with me when i came up and i'd been in the league for seven or eight years at that point and i came up and he's like what are you doing dude you know I'm like, what are you talking? I thought you would be, I thought that was more impressive than you're making it. And uh, something happened. I don't know why he was not impressed, but I remember seeing him after. And Darren is a, a great guy. I had a tremendous amount of respect for him. And um, I think they both, he wanted to come out and, and set the tone. And obviously we were, we were going to answer that. And it just happened. He, he obliged me. I remember after the fight, he tapped me on the, on the head and he said, man, I didn't know you were lefty. I said, only when I'm re only when I'm really scared, Darren. And uh, you know, we never tussled after that. We uh, he earned my respect, and I think I earned his too. You went full southpaw, Rocky Balboa in that bout, and it was awesome. Um, the last <laughs> one here, 
take us back to 2002, April, your buddy Saku has returned from cancer and you spent a lot of time recovering uh, with them throughout your own injuries. Mm. What, uh, what was that game like? That's the greatest moment of my career. You know, uh, probably a top five moment in my life. Um, in September, before that training camp, uh, Sack had flown over. He wasn't feeling good. And uh, he wasn't at the first day of training camp. And Craig Reve called me and he said, hey, you know, I got to tell you something. And he told me that Sack was sick. Sack came over to Rib's house that night and I seen him and, you know, it was, it was just kind of normal, right? It's like, okay, I, no one, I had never really been affected by cancer personally by someone that I, that I really cared about. And um, the next time I seen Sack was about Christmas time. And now I was hurt. I broke my hand that year and I had problems getting back surgeries and Sack came and he was in the hospital that, so call it December, right? So we're about three, three months he was probably about 160 pounds. He was wearing mittens and he was wearing a toque and his, his jacket right up. And you couldn't hug him. You couldn't, he was giving you fist pumps like this and he was so frail. And um, I remember leaving the rink and I just wanted to cry. I couldn't believe that that was Zach, right? And he started feeling better. We started training. You mentioned Scott Livingston started skating us. And, and I was like, if that guy thinks he's coming back, well, I'm coming back too. You know, I remember thinking that. And then we got to the night where he came back and I think they gave him an ovation for probably 10 or 11 minutes. Every time they tried to tell the crowd to, to settle down, it got louder. And I mean, even talking about it makes the hair on my arm stand up. It was, it was one of the most incredible moments for sure in my life to be a part of that. But I think anyone who was in the arena that night would tell you it was one of the most incredible moments of their life too. So um, Sack is one of the, he's still one of my best friends. Um, I love him. I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. Him coming back that year from cancer and, and playing. And actually I think he led our team in the playoffs that year too in points, but it, it had a profound effect on my career. It had a profound effect on my career, watching him come back, work his butt off to get back, and then to lead us. I think we beat we beat some maybe we beat someone in the first round and we lost in the second round. But anyways, um, what an absolute warrior that guy is! And what an absolute warrior you were throughout your the entirety of your career, Sheldon. To close out, they say don't meet your idols. You truly are one of my all time favorite people. I can't even mm. begin to explain to you how much this means to me. So thank you for taking away the time. Uh, you're a champion for mental health. You're a champion for love. You love love. And I'm just really proud of the man that you've become since your days as a player. So I really just want to say thanks again so much for carving out all this time. Where can people find you and stay up to date with you and everything you got going on? Um, I think my Instagram is SRA. You know, there's nothing. It's going to be a bunch of baby pictures and, and pictures of my family on there. But um, I will say thanks. You know, we met through Instagram and you asked me to do this. I don't really do them because no one wants to care. Or no one cares about listening to, you know, washed up old hockey player. But Please. you've been so kind and, you know, giving me this um, this platform. So it was a real pleasure to talk to you. And I, I wish big things for you, man. Dude, I really appreciate that. Thank you again so much, my man. Uh, enjoy the rest of the night. Go get those burgers. Go get that shake. I hope you and Tess have a good rest of the night. Thanks, buddy. You come to Coeur d'Alene Burgers on me. You got it. You got it. Next time in Vegas, I'll hit you up too. 100%. <laughs> Thank you.